Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so um, this, today we have the, the opportunity to have um, Emily Hill come and visit us for a day and, and give a talk. So she uh, did her PhD at Delaware with Lori Pollock, and for the past year, almost a year and a half, mm -hmm. she's been an associate professor at Montclair State. Um, and she's here visiting us today to talk about uh, her work on natural language programming and, uh, and software engineering. Mm -hmm. So take it away. Thanks. All right. So in general, my research is motivated by the problem where you've got this huge source code base and someone's got to maintain it. And the poor maintenance developer needs to somehow identify the code that they're looking for. And there's a couple steps that they take in trying to locate that code. If they don't have an expert available to tell them where to look, then they have to do something else. So one way to locate relevant methods and fields is by searching the source code and trying to look for big regions of the code that might be relevant and then further exploring those areas to see to refine their understanding and really see what else is relevant to exactly what the task they're trying to solve. So today what I'm going to talk about is how we can use the natural language in the source code, the words and the comments and the identifiers to help the developer search and explore and understand their code more effectively. And in fact, research has shown that developers spend more time finding and understanding code than fixing bugs, so we can help reduce the high cost of software maintenance if we can speed up this process. So what are the current approaches that developers typically use in addressing these issues? Well, there's a wide variety of navigation and exploration tools, and those are commonly built into IDEs using the program structure like the AST, the call graph, the type hierarchy and it allows the developer to jump to related source code. These are techniques that developers use all the time. And they're great, they take advantage of the program structure, but sometimes they can be predominantly manual and slow for very large and scattered code bases because each navigation step has to be initiated. And if your code takes multiple steps, every time you're locating a new piece of code, you're initiating navigation step after navigation step to navigate that program structure. So, What's an alternative? Well, there are search tools which work similar to how we search the internet using either Google or Bing. And they apply string matching with these comments and identifiers. And so they do allow you to locate large and scattered codes, but they tend to have a problem with returning many irrelevant results and missing a lot of relevant ones. Because if a developer enters in a query and it doesn't match the words the original developer used in the source code, then the search results not going to return anything relevant. So both tools have strengths, but both, al both also have challenges. So how can we go about improving these software maintenance tools to help facilitate software maintenance? So our observation is that programmers express concepts when writing code. So they use the program structure, if else statements, method calls, what algorithmic steps, the order they organize their statements within their code, but also the natural language, the words and the comments and the identifiers. So our approach is to leverage both these sources of information to try and build more effective software engineering tools. And our specific target is software maintenance. So let me give you an example of combining program structure and natural language information together. So let's say we have an auction sniping program. It'll allow us to automatically bid on an eBay auction online. And we're looking for the code that implements adding an auction. So the user is going to add an auction to the system. And I happen to know from prior, ex prior experience with the system that do action is the method that handles all user triggered events. If I'm just using program structure, I can see that do action calls 40 methods. That's not terrible, but only two of those 40 are relevant. So going through that list of 40 is a poor use of the developer's time. If I use natural language alone and search the entire code base, I get about 50 methods, 90 matches across 50 methods. And I located the relevant two, but I also located tons of irrelevant ones. But if we combine this information and put it together, we can locate the two relevant ones with just one false positive. So narrowing our list of 40 to 50 methods to just three for the developer to look through. So we want to try and combine 
program language, program structure, and natural language to help us improve tools and get better information. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, please feel free to interrupt. Clarification. Um, with that, when, was mm -hmm. that an intersection of the programming language answers and the, and the natural language answers to get yes. to? Well, we used, basically we used search techniques, the natural language, on the program structure. So the subset, we only searched the 40 callees of do action. No, good question. When you say sort of natural language alone, are you talking about semantic analysis at all? Or are you just saying just the comment section? Uh, mo so comments and identifiers. So any, word, any text that shows up. But any sort of syntactical analysis? Are you doing that also? Um, when you say natural language? So... Usually I mean bag of words at the base level, although we've been working to build more semantic and syntactic analysis on top of that. Okay. So I'll actually show you what I mean by that <laughs> down the road. <laughs> but strictly natural language information, what it boils down to is somehow using the words, whether that's just straight list of these, this set of words is in a method, or if it's more advanced than that. So, and actually, Thank you, that leads me right to my next point, <laughs> is that when using this natural language information and combining it with program structure, it's not enough to use the words alone independently. The context of how the words appears is very important. So for example, we have three occurrences of the word map. So we have map object in the method name, where map is playing the role of a verb or an action, versus object map, which is like a hash map that contains objects, so that's really its noun sense. And then we might have the words map and object just on two completely unrelated statements in the method, but the word map shows up. So the context of how that word's appearing, if it's a query word, is very important to improving our accuracy for the search. As well as the location of the word, for example, a method signature is typically a better summary or abstraction of what a method's doing than a random word just anywhere in the method body. And so we try and leverage that information to help improve accuracy as well. So let me show you an example of why using context and location is so important. So for example, I like adding things to my... <laughs> so if we're searching for add item in a piece of shopping cart software, for example, on the left, I have a method add entry, and on the right, I have a method called sum. So both are different senses of the word add. So when I talk about context, I'm talking about going from lexical concepts, which is the individual words itself, commonly referred to as the bag of words approach in information retrieval, versus phrasal concepts. So if we look at just straight word occurrences, both of these methods contain the words add and item. Both equally match. But if we evolve that to phrasal concepts, so concepts that consist of multiple words, we can see that the left hand side, add entry, actually is adding an item, whereas sum is actually adding a price. So by taking advantage of these phrasal concepts, we can better identify the relevant add entry method over the irrelevant sum. In addition, location further helps us. So the phrasal concept and the signature for add entry is add item entry, which again contains the query words of add item, whereas the signature in sum is simply sum, and we could put in a direct object there if we wanted. But helping the looking at the location, the method signature versus the body, further helps us figure out what the topic of this method, what action is it really trying to take. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our work for query, query reformulation, which is where we help the developers select query words and determine result relevance, which was the motivation for our next step, which was developing a model of word usage in software to actually capture these phrasal concepts in a general way that's usable by software engineering tools besides just software search. And then how does that model with phrasal concepts help us improve software search how can we take advantage of natural language and program structure and program exploration? And then if we combine these two pieces together, how much can we lead, lead to improvements? So any questions before I change topics? <laughs> okay, well, not really changing topics. Just changing problems slightly. Okay, so with query reformulation, we're concerned with helping the developer pick the right query words to help maximize the results of their search and determine if the results are relevant or not. So when developers search source code, they typically start off with a query that's executed by some search method on the source code base, and then those results are returned to the developer. I'm sure you've all experienced this before, <laughs> whether it's on the web or on a source code base. 
And if those results are relevant, the developer can stop their search. If they're not what they're looking for, they can continue to repeat this process until they either get relevant results or they get so frustrated they stop and they walk away and they use some other means to locate the code that they're looking for. In this process, the developer faces two key challenges. First, in deciding what query words they actually have to search for. And secondly, in determining whether or not those results are relevant. And I'm going to go into detail as to why those are so challenging. So first, why is selecting a query difficult? Well, when we're searching software, we have to guess what words the original developer used to implement the concept. And actually, research has shown that two people, when trying to select words to describe a familiar concept, only agree about 10 to 15 percent of the time. So this is a really, really common problem, not just in code search, but in searching in general. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Is that agreement without talking to each other or agreement after? <laughs> With, without talking to each other. So two people trying to describe, like maybe they saw a picture trying to pick words to describe it. Are those developers or just general people? I think the target was developers for this case, although I would have to double check that. I, don't hold me to that. <laughs> I, it, may be, it may be more general information retrieval research result there, because I don't think that study has been done for developers. Although uh, bigger staff has done some work on how difficult it is to describe those concepts. So the three major challenges in selecting query words, first, you can have multiple words with the same meaning. So you might formulate the query delete, but that concept is implemented as remove, RM, or DEL as an abbreviation. Then you might have a single word that has multiple meanings. So add, as we saw in our prior example, can mean either appending or adding to a list versus summing. And those are two different senses. You're going to get irrelevant results if you use that one general word. And even if you pick the exactly right word to describe the concept you're looking for, let's say going back to our auction sniping program example, let's say you want the code that implements the data storing the auctions in the system. Auction is clearly the right word, but it's an auction sniping program. The word auction is going to appear everywhere throughout the code. So it's not a good discriminator. So even if the word is perfectly correct and accurate, if it's too frequently occurring, it's not going to be specific enough to get you the results you're looking for. So all three of these challenges really conspire to make it difficult to come up with a good query. And then it really makes it difficult for the search tool to try and suit any arbitrary query anyone could think up all the time. So it actually becomes very challenging. So that's the first challenge we're trying to address. The second challenge is why is determining result relevance so difficult? Well, typically, in a typical IDE, when we do a keyword search or regular expression search, typically the results are presented just in a list. With the relevant results, we have to read through the code to find if the results are relevant or not. So the challenge, if we think about when we search the web, it's very easy to pull out where our query words appear, what their context is. They're bold, the query words are bold-faced in the context of the sentences where they're used. The titles of the web pages are nice in a big, bold font. They're bigger. They're in a different color. And so it's much easier when I enter a query into something like Bing or Google, I can quickly see, ah, did my, was my query even right? Before I even go looking to answering whatever question I have, the reason I made the search, I can quickly figure out if my query is even in the ballpark. But with source code, the developer could actually waste time trying to understand code that's not even relevant. And to me, that's like the, the biggest crime <laughs> is that understanding code is hard enough without having to understand code just to figure out if your query was getting you the right source code. Mm -hmm. So you do something similar to what Google does? I mean, they highlight the relevant words and they show it in some context, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you couldn't do that? Or well, is that where you're going? That is kind of where I'm going. And actually, you could take that idea further. I have only pushed it a little bit in terms of we're going to use phrases to embed those query words and give that context because it's easier to read a natural language phrase than mm -hmm. some source code. But you could even go further and highlight even more. Mm -hmm. Are there studies to show how long this takes to scan through a list of search results like the old stack? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. And I think it's highly dependent on how expert you are and how familiar you are with the code system. So we normally assume that the person searching has very little familiarity with the code system, and so they're going to take the longest. If you know the code base, you're probably going to be really get pretty good at filtering out the irrelevant results. But a newcomer to a system that's really unfamiliar, they're probably going to have to read each result. And it depends on how fast you read, how 
quick you are, but no, I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that have evaluated that. I've heard Gail Murphy mention even that, no, I don't know if it's in any papers, that it, it can take like multiple minutes per, and that people will typically like give up after five to ten. Like she's seen developers to go down the list, like not even go down the whole list. It's like Google. Google. Yeah. Give up after the first three. Yep. Or one. Five to ten. Or one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they don't scroll. No, the average, yeah, yeah. I think for information retrieval in general, the average is five to ten. They'll look at five to ten results, and if they don't see it, they'll give up. But the, in the, that code list, it's just alphabetically in, in most cases. And so if your alphabetical listing of file names, it doesn't show up right away, you might have the right query and just not know it. So if we could really get the developer to figure out, is their query even right, and then hone in on the correct results, that, that's our goal. So the problem is that search results in general can't be quickly skimmed which we're going to try and change. And the results are poorly organized, so you have to decide the relevance of each result. You, you have 50 matches. You might look at the first 5 to 10. If you're really, really exhaustive, you might look at all of them. But you have to keep determining the relevance and making that decision for each search result. So we'd like to change that. So our key insight is that the context of the query words in the source code is going to enable skimming, organization of results and provide faster feedback for poor queries. We don't claim that we can automatically correct the developer's query. Only they understand their information need. But if we can give them that feedback faster so they can more quickly change their query, that's a win for us. So we're going to automatically capture our context by generating phrases from the source code. So for example, if I had the signature add item, I could generate a phrase add new book item, for example, or update event compare playlist file to object, or load history. So for example, if our query is load, we can quickly see that this result is loading history versus loading a file, downloading a file, delivering a payload. So just by seeing how the query word appears with other words in the signature will help us make that determination more quickly. And we try and make it faster to read because usually humans can read natural language sentences faster than source code. And we're going to organize these phrases into a hierarchy. And I'll show you an example of how we do that. OK, so if we take an example task, let's say we're searching a JavaScript interpreter for a signed integer conversion. So our query is 2int, and there are 30 results for 2int, which I've listed to the right. And we could look through this entire list. Or if we could use our phrases to try and group them together, we might be able to hone in on the relevant results faster. So the phrase hierarchy at the very top is the query, 2 int 30. And below that, we have three subphrases: add value to code int 16, object to int map, and 2 int 32. And since signed in our conversion involves the 32 bit, 2 int 32 is the subphrase that we're really interested in. That's where we think we'll find our relevant results. So we're able to discard about 30 of uh, 27 <laughs> of the other results. And the context of the query words in the phrase helps us determine the relevance more quickly. So we're reducing the number of relevance decisions from 30 results down to just three phrases and then three results to verify that those three phrases, those three results are the correct relevant signatures. Yes, so we automatically generate those phrases from the signatures and they use a, a partial opportunistic phrase matching that greedily groups them together into a hierarchy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Are those phrases every identifier from the signature of the method that you're considering, or is it just a subset? So it's mo we usually generate them for the entire signature. And I think in this iteration, we also generated it for the parameters, too. But we tried to match the longest subphrase. So that usually prevented us from grouping based on like formal parameter names, unless that provided the largest grouping. Does that make sense? No. Uh, okay. Just keep going. Okay. okay. No, we do generate it for the parameters, but usually they're grouped in based on their signatures. And so typically they're based, so for example, to int, you notice we can split up to an int. They don't have to be right next to each other, like add value to code int 16, things like that. So are these phrases represented internally as just words, or do you have some sort of model, semantic model like Thank you. That's actually exactly where we're going. So we started off with strict phrases, and then we recognized the potential. If we could build that general model 
any software engineering tool could use it. And so that's our ultimate goal. And so that's actually the next section. So almost there. <laughs> All right, and just to give you a sense of how we generated the phrases, because this was kind of our starting point for building the model, um, is that fields and constructors, we naively assumed they were all noun phrases. They didn't involve actions, so file writer, report display panel. And then we assumed that method names were verb phrases. They started with a verb, and they had an optional object after them. So verb phrases consist of a verb followed by a direct object, and an optional preposition and indirect object. And if you've forgotten your grammar before I did this research, I didn't remember the difference. <laughs> um, if we take an example phrase like add item to list, add is the verb, and then to is a preposition, and then item is the direct object, and list is the indirect object. So we always look for a verb and a direct object, and if there is a preposition in the method name, then we go hunting for the indirect object. So, our real challenge was identifying the direct and indirect ob objects of the verb. And we typically look first in the name. That's obviously the best indicator. And if it wasn't there, we looked at the first formal parameter and then at the class name. So for example, get connection type, run iReport compiler, update event, or compare playlist file to object. Mm -hmm. Did you find any uh, sort of computer science or programmer specific idioms that you needed to also heavily mined. Like, I mean, I see a lot of code that says x digit to mm -hmm. y you know, for transformations from x to y. Yeah, so we mostly avoided two, although I did have a version of an identifier splitter that pre-processed two and tried to use it and make it convert. So we did some work with idioms like convert, especially if it starts with the preposition to, to string, that's converting something to a string. Digit two. Right, no, I know. Okay. I, I, if I handled it, it was during the identifier splitting phase where I could try to detect that. Um, but in general, if it started with like a TO preposition, we might infer convert. Um, and there were a couple special cases. But again, it, it's all how much time do you want to spend in doing that. And so for query formulation, just generating these phrases, we didn't actually need that level of detail. It still worked pretty well. But as we go to the more general model, we have to spend more and more time in making that more accurate and doing that parsing. And I'll show you how we go about doing that in general. So to evaluate, I called our query reformulation technique contextual search because it uses the context of the query words. And to evaluate it, we compared it with an existing technique called verb direct object, which is very similar to our technique except it's only the, the verb and the direct object. It doesn't consider any general noun phrase method names or prepositional phrases. And we compared search results from 22 developers on 28 maintenance tasks. They're searching for 28 concerns or search tasks. And here we have box plots for the comparison between contextual search, which I've called context, and verb DO on the right. And they're box plots. So the middle shaded box represents the middle 50% of the data. The horizontal line is the median. And plus is the mean. And x's represent outliers. So we measured, we compared these two techniques in terms of effort, which we measured using the number of queries the user entered. Ideally, we would have liked to measure effort in terms of time, but we didn't want to tell our subjects that they were being timed. And some of them ate during one half of the experiment, but not in the other. And so unfortunately, all we have is the number of queries for effort. <laughs> and also in terms of effectiveness, using the common information retrieval measure of F measure, which combines precision and recall. And we could see that contextual search requires less effort than verb do and returned more effective results, which further justifies, because contextual search significantly outperforms verb do, it justifies going down this path that the more accurate we make our information, instead of just stopping with verbs and direct objects and really trying to model noun phrases and prepositional phrases, we can actually get significant improvements. Is that a hand? The, the measurements or did the comparisons hold true within subjects for every subject? Yes. Yes, because that's how we ran it. We did a paired. We ran it both ways. We did the two sample t-test as well as a paired because it was a kind of a mixed model result. But yes, it held for both of them. Yep. Okay. Although a lot of the subjects liked what verb do did that contextual search didn't was that it also did co-occurring pairs so if you entered a, your query had to be a verb followed by a direct object 
But if you entered a verb, it would list all the other co-occurring direct objects. And if you entered a direct object, it would list all other co-occurring verbs. And the subjects did like seeing what other words co-occurred with their query words. So they did really like that, but it was so limited because it only matched using verb and direct object. It couldn't, there were some search tasks that it, they couldn't formulate queries for. And that's partly what led to it. So a combination ultimately would be ideal. And we're, we're actually still working on trying to take that to the next level. OK, so any other questions about that before I move on? OK. So as you mentioned before, we started getting inspired by these phrases and thinking, gosh, what else could we do with them? And another student at the time actually wanted to work on automatically generating comments. And we thought, you know, if we could really turn these phrases into a generalized model of the semantics of the program structure and the natural language in the underlying source code, it, it could be used in almost any software engineering tool that uses textual information. And so the challenge was, well, how do we go from phrases to a generalized model that more people can be take advantage of? So with query, query reformulation, our phrases capture noun phrase and verb phrase phrasal concepts for methods and fields. So for example, convert result, load history, synchronize list. But we needed to generalize that model from a textual representation just with phrases to a model of this phrasal structure so these could be annotated with their different roles in the natural language. And we also needed to improve the accuracy. For example, if I'm going from a method or field signature to a phrase, I could actually mistakenly label a verb as a noun and the phrase would still come out readable and correct. But when we want to internally represent it as a phrasal concept, we have to have a lot higher accuracy. So our goal is to represent the conceptual knowledge of the programmer as expressed in both the program structure and the natural language through these phrasal concepts. So any piece, we're trying to provide a generalized model that can be used in automated tools that represents or encodes what a human sees when they read code. We're, we're, that's our goal, where we're trying to get to. So this is an overview of our software word usage model, which I'll call SWUM, and it consists of three layers. The top layer is the program model, which any program analysis, any program structure you've used before, that would fall into that layer. ASTs, call graphs, type hierarchies, that's the traditional analysis layer. At the bottom, there's a word layer, so each word individually, and that's what's typically been used by textual analysis techniques in the past, that so-called bag of word model. So our real insight, our contribution is this interior middle layer, SWUM core, which models the phrasal concepts. And that's where we do the parsing of the words into verb phrases and noun phrases and start annotating them with action and theme. Now, at this level, I'm switching to the words action and theme from verb and direct object because verb do are syntactic layer information, whereas action and theme are more semantic, slightly higher level concepts. So that's, but for all intents and purposes, you can think of them as verb and direct objects. You won't be far off. Okay, and so we have three different types of nodes, one for each layer, program element nodes, word nodes, and then phrase structure nodes, which represent the phrasal concepts. And in terms of edges, within each layer we have edges. At the top we have structural edges. In the middle we have parse edges. At the bottom we have word edges. So we can represent things, for example, you could do synonyms or stems. If you want to know that adding is the same as add, you could put that kind of word relationship in the bottom layer. And between the layers, we have the bridge edges that allow us to go from the program structure to the phrase structure. So you can navigate and take advantage of all the information in the AST and call graph, as well as all the semantic information between the parses and the phrasal concepts. So we're really trying to provide an integrated solution so that people don't, tool developers don't have to understand all the parsing details, but they can still leverage textual information in their software engineering tools. And so our goal is that if we had a model like this, we could provide an interface between people that want to use textual information and people that are working on improving the accuracy of the parsing layer. Just similar to how the PDG became an interface for researchers and developers using program analyses. So that's our ultimate goal. It might not be SWUM, could be something similar, but that's what we're working towards. So what are some of the challenges in automatically constructing such a model? Well, first, we have to accurately identify the part of speech. This is a well-understood problem for natural language, 
but in the subdomain of software, it becomes even more challenging. So for example, the same word might have multiple parts of speech. And actually, I really like the example fire <laughs> because in natural language, it's typically a noun. You see fire and you try to put it out. But in source code, fire is often a verb. It can be a noun modifier, like an adjective, or it can be the noun if it was in a gaming system. And so for every word in an identifier, we have to somehow identify some kind of part of speech for it if we want to accurately parse the identifier names. And so our approach is to use both the position of the word in the identifier and its location. Is it in a field? Is it in a method? Is it in a constructor? To help us try and disambiguate what part of speech the word is. And then, after we've identified the parts of speech, then we need to parse them by identifying the action, theme, and secondary arguments for any method, verb, phrases we have. Noun phrases are very simple. We don't go beyond noun modifiers and nouns, so we don't differentiate between adjectives or nouns that have become adjectives, things like that. But verb phrases and identifying these themes and secondary arguments, that's where the challenge is. So for example, we have a reactive method, action performed, which doesn't tell us much about what the method's doing. So that we don't have a very good solution for yet, handle action performed. Tear down set group test, convert restriction to minimum cardinality, or add auction entry. And what we've done in phrase generation, we just generated all the phrases. So we would generate add entry, add auction entry, we just generate them all. But in the, building this model, we try to take a step back so we can present as much and preserve as much information as possible for the end tool because we don't know exactly what that tool is going to be. So now what we do is we would say the action is add. And there's two themes, entry and auction entry, and those are equivalent. They describe the same thing. So we would figure out where, if there is a direct object in the name, does it overlap a parameter? It, do, the, do the head words, the last words to the right of the phrase, do they overlap? And so we would identify that those are equivalent. Mm -hmm. oh, do you want me to go back? No, go ahead. No, oh, okay. <laughs> Ask at the end? Okay. So how do we go about developing these SWUM construction rules. So our research process is to analyze how developers actually use words in code. And so the concept behind any machine learning or natural language technique is that if a human can recognize it, we can train some automatic tool to recognize it. But you have to be careful of cost-benefit analysis. Sure, I can recognize anything a human can, but how long is it going to take me to develop those rules? So we're, we've been highly motivated by our target software engineering applications. Query reformulation required the least analysis. It still worked really well. We generated really readable phrases with very, with, with not as accurate rules. And then for search, I didn't need to be quite as accurate as we needed to be for comment generation. When we're actually generating text for human consumption that summarizes a method, we had to be even more accurate. And so we've been refining our rule identification process to be more and more accurate each iteration with each new tool we're targeting. So for example, I started with 9,000 open source Java programs because they're available. It's what I had on hand. And we'll start with those identifier names and try to classify each name into a partition. The first easiest way is to classify them into method names and field names. And then I'll analyze each partition and evaluate the accuracy of our current approach on a random subset. So for example, we could start and assume that every method name starts with a verb. And in fact, that's where we started with phrase generation for query reformulation, is we assumed every method name did start with a verb. And we look at our random subset, and we can see that's true for the first three methods. But for size and length, those are actually getters with noun phrases, noun beginnings. Two string and next start with prepositions. And synchronized list actually starts with an adjective. So our next challenge is to refine our approach and our classification. First, we identify which partitions are missing. That's usually the easy part. But then we have to figure out how to automatically identify and categorize these method signatures into those partitions. And we would continue repeating this process on a random sample until we were happy with the level of accuracy for our target software engineering application. So as we keep evolving this representation over time, we're working to, impro to improve the accuracy more and more. So we have this model, but how expensive is it? <laughs> is it going to scale to really, really big software? 
Well, in terms of space, if you build the entire model, it contains a node for every identifier and every unique word that's used. And the number of edges is linear with respect to the number of words within those identifiers and whatever structure or word information is included in the model. So that may be very dependent on your target software engineering application based on how much program structure information you need. Do you just need the AST or do you need more than that? In terms of time, it can be constructed incremental, built incrementally and constructed on demand, so that helps limit the costs. I created an unoptimized research prototype, and to give you a sense for how long that took, I analyzed signatures for a 74,000 line of code program in 11 seconds and 1.5 million lines of code in 11 minutes. So we consider that to be reasonable for most of the codes we're looking at, but I don't think they're quite as large as what you guys might be looking at. So <laughs> that would definitely be something to consider. Um, and there are some optimizations that can be done. First, you can optimize by the level of program structure and accuracy that you need. For example, in query reformulation, I didn't need the level of accuracy I needed for searching. So some optimizations can be improved that way. And it could also be constructed once and used in many software engineering tools. So if you wanted to commit to this kind of representation for a wide variety of software engineering tools, it would make more sense to use the expensive analysis because you'd get to reuse it over and over again across different software engineering tools. And because it can be built incrementally, it can be updated incrementally overnight, so you just have the one cost up front, the first big time batch, and then you could incrementally update it as the code evolves. So what other software engineering tools can it be used in? <laughs> so, so far we've applied it to source code search, also known as concern location. As well as program comprehension and development, we've applied it to automatically generating comments to summarize what a method's doing. It could also be used for automatic documentation program changes, automatic recommendation of API methods, a novice programming tutor, anywhere you could use text to help solve a software engineering problem, you can take advantage of this kind of analysis. In terms of traceability, linking software artifacts together, external documentation, emails, bug reports to the source code. Um, that involves getting a representation that's similar to SWUM for those natural language artifacts. In theory, that's the easier problem because analysis tools exist for natural language text in general, although they have to be probably tweaked for certain types of software artifacts. We could also work on building more intuitive natural language based interfaces. For example, from debugging the Y line interface by Cohen Myers, they were asking questions about the program execution. They were pre canned, pre programmed in. We might be able to allow the user to ask more informative questions. They could initiate rather than just having a list of questions, possibly. And also helps with text mining of software repositories. For example, we can use this kind of representation to automatically build a word net for software synonyms by looking at verbs that are in the method signature as well as in the body. Uh, and also to continue improving our SWUM's construction rules. So we can use SWUM to help improve SWUM in the future and make it more accurate. But anywhere you could use text to solve a software engineering problem, that's really where this could be used. As long as it's worth it. As long as this is adding something, adding value, adding accuracy. So any questions about the general model before I show its improvement in something like search? Yes, okay. Um, when you were trying to distinguish between the add entry and whether it's an auction entry or just an entry, could you, have you considered also looking at the call sites to see what the variable is that they call, the variable name of the thing that got passed in as the argument to that method? Right. Because that's another name for what? Yes. So I was just demonstrating the signature level analysis, but yes, when we actually analyze a method call, we take into account both the formal, the actual, its type of the variable. We, we, so we have like four sources of information, the variable's name and type for both the actual and the formal. And we may have an additional source of information if the method call as a whole is nested inside another method. That's like a sub, the formal parameter for whatever that's a parameter for is also a summary related. So yeah, we do chain them together when we get to the within the method body analysis, we do chain those all together uh, to extract as much, every last drop of information we can. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, so I, I guess two questions. One, it seems like this is specific to the natural language being used. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect that a, a large majority of code that's written uses like English identifiers and things, but 
Um, my two questions are, how difficult would it be like if you were working on a German code base or Chinese or, or whatever, and do you have any notion of how prevalent that is? I mean, have you seen open source code that's written in a different language? Yeah, my 9,000 programs contain German and French and Spanish and Italian. But it's not a lot, but it's there. It's clearly there. <laughs> uh, languages because the structure may be different? Well, yeah, if, if they're structuring the identifiers differently. So the challenge is if they're used to writing in English and they just start writing in another language, they might actually still follow English naming convention patterns just with different words. That's really simple to address. But if they're actually changing the structure of how they name things, like German can have a different phrase structure, I think, than English does. And if they don't start their method names with verbs anymore, then you have to completely develop a new part of speech analysis for that. So it is challenging when it's if it's not just a substitution. If things are kind of in the same positions, they follow similar naming conventions, it's just different words, that's just a new dictionary. That That's easy. But if they actually see, reorder it. You just use like an off-the-shelf classifier to determine like what's a noun, what is a verb. Right. And so you have, and there are a lot of them that exist for other like natural languages. And so it's just a matter of tailoring them. The Some of the same techniques we've used to specialize them for software would work there, but you need some sense of the naming conventions used. I think really the big limitation of this is it's based on naming conventions, and if you change those significantly, whether it's another language, natural language, or another programming language, you're going to have to do a lot more work. If you're going from, this is mostly done in Java, if you're going to other object-oriented languages, like we've looked at C++, there are many similarities, but you have to just re-verify them, make sure that they're still following the same naming conventions, and that would apply whether you're looking at a natural or a programming language change. Mm -hmm. Do you find that some uh, this information is just not very useful? Like the names are poorly chosen? So for scientific software, all bets are off. Like predominantly par highly parallel codes, scientific codes where the variable names are all X, Y, Z, A, B, C. This is not going to work well. We know that. We've, <laughs> that's kind of a subdomain that we're analyzing separately because it has separate challenges. So we predominantly looked at Open source codes are typically GUI applications. They're, they have user interfaces. They have features that are typically well named because they're open source and they have to use the source code as a communication mechanism between the developers. Um, other places where it doesn't work well are, are what we call reactive method names, like API method names. If you're overriding an interface, you didn't get any choice in selecting that method name. So we have to really rely on the method bodies to build the semantic model or generate the summaries for comment generation, for example. So that's, but you can, st as long as inside that API method, as long as you've implemented some meaningful words, then we can still use it. But you're saying you also do look at the program structure within a function, the, the, the actual statements? Yeah, depending on which problem we're solving. For search, I haven't gone that level because it's too expensive, but for comment generation, we, we have to because we're trying to generate a, summer, a summary of a method automatically. So, but yes, we do have method mechanisms for analyzing and trying to summarize the substatements. So we have some analysis for loops, for if statements, for blocks of statements to summarize what they're doing in general, summarizing that action. And so the same concepts can be used to automatically debug method names by looking at what the inside is. Does it match? what the method name itself is, like a setter that doesn't set anything. <laughs> you know, that's an example of things we can detect using this mechanism. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. I ran out of water. Okay. okay. So now, my target application that I've been mostly interested in using this model is to improve search. Can we make search more accurate for software? And really, I'm mostly concerned with improving the precision. And so that's where the phrasal concepts come in. So this is a, a specific example of SWAM to give you a better understanding of how we're using it. So in the top left, I have a very small snippet of code. So it's main object.java. The method is called handle fatal error. And it has one line of code, syslogger.doprint, and it's printing an error. The program structure representation of that method call in the body is syslogger. Is in, so doprint, the method doprint is invoked on the expression syslogger, and it has an actual parameter of error. And that maps to the phrase structure all the way to the right. I've gone ahead and put the word nodes right in the phrase structure layer. That's usually how I think about it. But technically, these can be three separate layers, and it helps with the optimization. But for readability, I've put them all up here. So the gray nodes are the phrase structure nodes. So we have the verb phrases, prepositional phrase, and a noun phrase. And the white nodes are the word nodes. 
So for search, what we use are these different semantic roles. We have an action, do print. We have a theme or a direct object, error. Our secondary argument is to sys logger. In this case, we've inferred the preposition to, and we have some rules to do that. But it's not general. It's just there's some specific ones we can look for. And we also have an auxiliary argument um, if we have additional formal parameters. So for example, error is our theme. We might find that that's equivalent to the error in the formal parameter, for example. So we, have addition, we can have additional auxiliary arguments, especially if there is a whole list of additional formal parameters. Any of them that's not Boolean is usually added to the auxiliary argument list unless it starts with a verb that we know typically has Boolean arguments. But I'm, I'm getting into low-level details <laughs> there. So, but the really important thing is that we have these different semantic roles. Action, theme, secondary argument, if there's some kind of preposition involved, and any remaining auxiliary arguments. So that we can throw all the information from the signature, all the information we can find, into one of these semantic roles. And we take that into account in calculating our relevance score. We also take into account the head distance, which is the location within the phrase structure. So in natural language phrases, there's this concept that the word all the way to the right in the phrase, the last word in a phrase, is, it, is the head word. And it's really the theme of that phrase. So for example, we have the phrase syslogger. It's less about sys or system and more about logger, because logger is in the position of the head. So logger is, would be labeled as head, and sys would be labeled as one away from the head. And so we also use that head distance, because if a query word appears in the head position, it, that method or that phrase is more likely to be relevant to the query in that case. So the different sources of information we use, as I just mentioned, we use the semantic role. And we assume that query word occurrences in the action and the theme are more relevant than occurrences in other argument roles. That's inspired by the verb direct object approach that was used before. And we also take into account the head distance, which that's a new aspect that hasn't been involved in software search before, as that the closer the query word is to this head position, the more strongly the phrase relates to the query word. So for example, in our auction example, special auction has more to do with auction than auction server, because auction server is really about a server, which happens to hold auctions, whereas a special auction is actually an auction. And the idea is to be greedy, and so that we have a diminishing head distance, so that as long as the word appears somewhere in the phrase, it comes up as relevant. But we want, we've chosen the score so that if it always appears in the head position, that'll obviously hit first. And later down on the list, we'll have other occurrences of the query words, just in case, to be greedy, if the query word never appeared in the head position, for example. So we try to do a best effort. And additional information we use is the location. Query words appearing in the signature, we believe more strongly indicate relevance than appearances in the body. And as with traditional information retrieval techniques, they typically use inverse document frequency to approximate usage in the rest of the program so that frequently occurring words throughout the entire program typically aren't good discriminators. And so we, we inversely weight their contribution to the score using IDF. Was that OK? In that way, you might, do you segment the difference between the method signature and the body? Because if you have printf, it's going to frequently occur in lots of bodies. But as a method signature, there's only one. So actually, we, we segment it just based on identifier splitting and whether or not we're using stemming. So we just split all the words and we use that as the IDF. We, don't, we haven't done a location-based IDF, although that would be an interesting thing to try and see. But the problem is, is that we don't know what the user is searching for. Do they want just the signatures or not? And so that's the challenge is figuring out how does the user specify? Do they know that they're looking in a certain role? And if they had that information, certainly we could take advantage of it. But I think that's the challenge of why we haven't done it yet. <laughs> Any more? OK. Uh, so this is, a, this is great, but it's very different from like a browser you know, search. Mm -hmm. uh, if users are sort of interested or are used to doing it one way, how can you sort of wake them up and say, hey, here's, we do things slightly different, but it's better, and 
Mm -hmm. Have you thought about? Well, our idea is that we want to make the query mechanism as simple as possible. It's it, we want the query mechanism to be a short two to three word phrase, the same way you'd search on the internet. That's our goal, and that's why we're going through all, jumping through all these hoops to try and make a short query be effective. Because really, the search problems are very different. When you're searching the web, you have an information need, you probably have a question. And as soon as you get one web page that's relevant, that answers your question, you're done. But when I'm searching code for maintenance purposes, I need every relevant occurrence. I'm not satisfied with just one relevant result. I need all of the relevant results. And so that's why we're working so hard to really try and get precise. And then we bring in program exploration techniques to try and improve the recall. Because right now we're searching over so many different methods. How can we find the ones that are the most relevant to the query? And then can we refine those further to improve the recall? That's kind of our approach. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're operating under the, the, the constraint that a query is like a sequence of words. Mm -hmm. um, and by providing some summary, you're allowing them to, to kind of in their head think, oh, I'm looking for a signature or I'm looking for, for something. But, but couldn't you, rather than displaying everything so they could filter, allow them to filter uh, preemptively by just mm -hmm. saying, when you query, instead of just providing just words, also, here are some things I care about, like I only care about methods, or I only care about you know, a class, or, or providing some additional information in the query instead of trying to provide it in the summary later on for them to filter. Right. Does that oh, make sense? Definitely. No, you could definitely, the more information they can give us, we just don't want to enforce that. We want to allow the ability, like, the holy grail for me has been I should be able to search for my source code this, as easily as I search the web with, with Google or Bing, for example. And so try, but as we refine this and try and better meet developer needs, I think we're going to find we're going to have to add things like that into that. But so far, we're just trying to make a general solution. How far can we push it? How accurate can we get? But it is really hard to make a general solution that works well because there's so many different types of information needs and so many different reasons a developer might be searching. It is hard to be all things to everyone. So I think our next steps are further specializing. Yep. I mean, like, if you think of web, uh, web search, mm -hmm. like what you frequently have is like web page optimization, so that it's easier to find. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have like, if you would change how people write uh, identifiers, web names, how would you change? So it's like, what would be, yeah, what would make uh -huh. it easier for your approach? To oh. To be found. oh, right. So you could, based on the rules we've learned, we can provide guidelines to developers that if you write your code and, and follow these patterns, we're going to be better able to find it. Definitely. So what we've tried to do is use naming conventions and patterns that developers use over a wide variety of source code. But if, especially if there are uh, company mandated naming conventions and you follow those, we can increase the rules and the accuracy a lot. So definitely, if that can be, if developers can have that information, it would definitely help us improve our accuracy, certainly. Yep. Although we're, we're, we've made our problem harder <laughs> by assuming that we don't have that luxury <laughs> and trying to still be successful. How, much, how far can we push it? How accurate can we get? I really think the accuracy is still only around like 70% 70, 70 F measure because there is a limitation to using the words alone because sometimes there's going to be methods that just don't contain any relevant words. And that's the challenge. <laughs> we can't, so there, there's like a bar and we're just trying to see, can we reach that bar and then how do we keep going beyond it? Mm -hmm. Speaking of methods with irrelevant words, um, what do you do for abbreviations? Um, well, I have an, a, a technique for abbreviation expansion, but it's not quite accurate enough yet that I've thrown it in here. And so that's partly why we've push the query reformulation technique so that the developer can more quickly explore how it's actually implemented. So if they wanted to use both the abbreviation and its full form, they could add that in, but by seeing what the words are used for. But yeah, right now, we're not taking that into account. There's certainly more room for synonyms, abbreviations, all of those things. Right now, we're just strictly going off the words themselves. Is there any way that you could leverage um, developers to help you in this task. So like, if you know, okay, my blind spots, here are methods that I just can't reason about. Mm -hmm. is, is, could you say, okay, I, you get an hours of a developer's time to annotate, mm. right? Like, like, I don't know these abbreviations, I can't expand them or something like that. Have you thought about, like, because people aren't going to annotate everything. Right. But sometimes if you can, can use people's time really effectively and they get right. some payoff later, no, definitely. We haven't really thought about that, but that is a really good idea if we could get developers to do that. A lot of this, unfortunately, we do ourselves, and so we're relying on 
our analysis. Uh, but, like, yeah. This isn't very well named. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you know where your blind yep. spots are, right? I've seen work that actually says this is named badly. Right. Fix this. Exactly. And yeah, if we could integrate that into ID and collect that information, then we could really help improve our our tools. Definitely. Any any information is helpful. <laughs> So one additional source of information that's been crucial for web search is the notion of a static rank of a page. Like, mm -hmm. what's the prior relevance of this this piece of information? Mm -hmm. And it feels like you could incorporate that same sort of information here, right? Like maybe mm -hmm. um, if, if a piece of code has a lot of callers or colleagues, like it's sort of a, a hub or authority in the colleague graph, it mm -hmm. might have greater relevance. If, if it spends more of program execution time inside that piece of code, maybe it's more important. Yep. Maybe it's closer to the main function, it's more important. Like. It feels like there's a bunch of sort of prior signals about the relevance of a piece of code, which could not only be used to help relevance, but also identify where you get the most bang for the buck if you're going to ask your developer right. to spend more time on things. Exactly. So have you put any time in like this prior? Uh, no. We, so we yeah. haven't used any relevance feedback yet, although there are some techniques that have that have used the hub and authority um, type of mechanism. Um, although it was counterintuitive and they had to actually turn it around. It was like the hubs were not the places you wanted to go. You, <laughs> because they were so interconnected, it means they're so general, they're not useful. But um, they have taken that into account. So we've focused purely on how much can we get from the structure and the words, but actually adding in some kind of hub and authority would be really helpful, I think, if we could use it to accurately identify it. Because obviously we getters and setters, low level methods, we don't want those. You probably don't want ones that are too high. <laughs> either. You kind of want ones there in the middle and I think you could use call graph information to help definitely. We haven't gone that step yet but definitely we could totally, any, any information you've got we could put into it and further increase the accuracy. I've just been focused on okay how far can we push the words themselves and then once, once we get there and figure out what that barrier is keep going. So did I see another? Hand? Yeah, have you thought about presenting the search results in a more graphical, structural way? Like maybe as you build up this model of all these functions, you have this sort of functional model of the whole mm -hmm. app. And it might be interesting to view the search results in the context of that graph or a call graph. Or Definitely. So actually, I personally really like seeing results. Oh, I really like seeing results in a call graph form, format. And that's part of the reason why we've worked towards integrating search and exploration, because that allows us to present it in a more graphical way. And you just get more of a context. Oh, that's my personal feeling. I don't know what developers in general want to see, and that we'd have to undertake a study to see what, how do people want to see it. And in an informal study of a handful of developers, we found that depending on what they were using it for, they really wanted a map where they could zoom in and out. Um, so presenting the results in a format where they could kind of zoom out and get more context or zoom in, which I think you guys have done work on. <laughs> um, but I, we haven't actually gone that far yet. We're working on can we automatically restrict that graph so that we're not overwhelming them with information using these search and exploration tools. But definitely how, that, how these results are presented, so far all we've really con contributed there is query reformulation and that phrase hierarchy, but that's definitely not where we want it to stay. We want to keep evolving it. But we need to study what developers really want to see first, unless we can leverage what some other people have studied. <laughs> other questions on this? OK, because I, I can show you some results of what we've done. OK. All right, so we evaluated our SWAM-based search technique with some existing search techniques. So there's ELEX, which is Eclipse's regular expression-based search. It's similar to GREP. We also use Google Desktop Search, which has been integrated into Eclipse. That's called GES. And then we also have Find Concept, which is really where we started from. That was the inspiration for our approach. And it's similar to the verb DO approach that we used before, except that it also uses synonyms in the query reformulation. So Find Concept, given a verb direct object query, it searches for verb DO pairs in comments and method signatures and allows the user to do query reformulation with synonyms and co-occurring verbs and direct objects. And SWUM-T has a similar interface to Google Desktop Search because we're using a similar query mechanism. And the relevance is determined by our SWUM score exceeding some threshold, which we dynamically determined based on the average of the top 20 results. And we used, for search tasks, we used eight concerns from a previous study, which had 60 relevant methods we were searching for across 10,000 irrelevant ones in four different programs. And in terms of queries, we use the top performing queries based on a prior evaluation. We didn't want to compare how well users could use these search tools. We wanted to see when a user was really able to get a good query in terms of precision recall or F measure, 
when were they most effective, and compare the techniques under those ideal situations. So the measures we used, again, were precision, recall, and the F measure commonly used in information retrieval. So what does it look like? So here we have a box plot of the F measure. Just as a quick reminder, the shaded middle region is the middle 50% of the data. Horizontal line in the middle is median, plus is the mean. And we can see, as we look from ELEX to GES, fine concept, and SWUM T all the way to the right, if we look at the height of the box of SWUM T, we, we consider SWUM T to be more consistently effective than the other techniques. It doesn't have the shortest box, but on the whole, it has the, sh the smallest box that's also highest. When we analyzed recall and precision, we found that ELEX, similar to GREP, had good recall, but the precision was so poor that overall it, it inundated the developer with results that were irrelevant. In terms of precision, we found that SWUM T and FIND concept were best, so that means using phrasal concepts did improve our precision. But in terms of recall, GES, which was the Google equivalent, and SWUM T were the best. So the advantage of SWUM over our prior competitor FIND concept was that it had just as good precision, but it slightly improved the recall because it's using a more general representation of phrasal concepts and not just verb direct objects anymore. And so this was really more a preliminary study, and we like to do a more widespread study to help flesh out these results because these results are not statistically significant because we're using a small number of queries because we're just using the best in terms of precision recall and F measure. And so we want to do a more general, broader study to further evaluate this. So slightly switching gears just for a second. Yes? Mm -hmm. Maybe I showed up late, but do you have an example of what kind of query, queries users are issuing in these? Uh, each, so each type of search is going to give a different type of query. So ELEX is going to be regular expression so query. Expression. They're going to yep. have like do dot start print or something yep. like that. And the users were allowed to interact with the tool until they were satisfied okay, and then so stop. Like, Here's what you're searching for now. Implement it using that. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good question. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yep. So yeah, and each of them, GES and SWUMT were the same keyword queries. Find concept had a specific verb followed by a specific direct object. And they could look at the search results and stop when they were satisfied. And that the last query was the one we used. They were searching for were like find me a method that prints out logging information or something. Well, it was slightly more. It was more feature oriented. So they might be shown a screenshot and said, "Find the code that implements this feature." They might be given a snippet of documentation and said, "Okay, find the code that implements this aspect of the system." So they're more feature based. Okay. But yep. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Good question. So I'm slightly switching gears because. After we've done this general search to find these seeds to start from, then we want to also further refine that and explore the program further. So, but these are really two different problems with two different goals. So in search, we're trying to find seeds, whereas in exploration, we're starting from these seed starting points. We've got these pegs in the code we can start hanging on. And we're trying to build our understanding of the code around it locally. The, and we're looking at relevant elements that are structurally connected to these seed starting points. So in search, our goal is really high precision because we're searching the entire code base. So we have this huge set of methods we're trying to prune down, whereas in exploration, we're trying to improve the recall further. So our solution was to use phrasal concepts in SWUM to improve precision. And actually, even though I've complained about the bag of words approach for information retrieval, it's actually very good for high recall. It's very greedy. So when we're exploring, we actually are using bag of words. <laughs> and our solution, we created a tool called Dora the Program Explorer. It used program structure and natural language, as well as location, signature versus body. Um, let's see. So in general, this is like the example I showed before. We use the frequency of the query words. So for example, I have do add on the left and an irrelevant method delete comment on the right. And the relevant method had six occurrences of the query words. The irrelevant one just had two. And we weighted the contribution of the frequency based on the signature was being more relevant than the body. And so we trained two weights using logistic regression on a training sample to calculate that score. So, and we also compared it to additional techniques. So we compared our DORA score, which was more advanced, to two naive approaches, and an OR. And returned true if all the query words were present, or returned true that something was relevant if any one of the query words were relevant. And we also compared our technique 
to a purely structural approach called Suede and evaluated on eight concerns mapped by three independent developers, which translated to 160 methods and over 1,800 edges with overlap. And what we found was that using natural language and program structure together does outperform just using program structure, but you have to be careful how you integrate that natural language information. Just putting natural language information, for example, if you selected the and naive approach, you'd be worse off than just using program structure alone. So how you combine the natural language information is very important. So the success is highly dependent on the textual scoring performance, and our more advanced DORA did appear to outperform the other techniques. So our real question is, though, is if we take our, search, our highly precise search technique and a greedier exploration technique like DORA to improve recall, how much more of the concern can we get? How much more, many more relevant results can we get for each search task? So what we did is we compared the three state-of-the-art search techniques with SWOM search plus DORA exploration. So in the bottom, we have ELEX, which is like GREP, GES, and FIND concept. And then at the, all the way to the right, we have SWOM search plus DORA exploring one edge away. And if we look at the medians, we can actually see that the median results are significantly higher than for search alone. So right now, we've seen that this is a promising direction to go in, that we can continue improving the results in general. If you're going to pick one solution, you're going to want to pick the solution that has the highest median, that's most effective most of the time. We're never going to have one silver bullet that solves, that's an, a perfect search all the time. But Search plus DORA does a better job in general than the other techniques. And we also found that results would be further improved if we assumed there was a human pruning away irrelevant search results before they went to the exploration phase. So in the first bar, S plus DORA, I took every search result in the top 10 and explored one edge away. And that was the accuracy. If we assume a human is pruning away some of those irrelevant ones, we get even better results. But again, the F measure is still only at 60 because that's about the limit that words are going to get us, even with the program structure, even with DORA. So this is a preliminary result, and we found it was very exciting. We also did some other studies and found that when we were searching using any base search technique, if we went two to three edges away from the starting seeds, we could get like 100% of the relevant results. So within two to three edges of the call graph, you can get almost an entire concern because programs are so highly interconnected, I believe is the reason for that. <laughs> So, Did you look at how many edges that requires looking at? Um, well, it grew. I mean, if, if you can reach like 20% or 30% of the program from any point in three edges, then. Yeah, no, the sweet spot was like returning the top seven results and then going and looking at the top five results two edges away. We found that was the sweet spot. It was for. So we got 80% of the correct results across the eight concerns we were looking at using that. So there is, so it's possible that you can pick these thresholds and combine them in such a way that you can get a win. Because we found that w to get every relevant result, we needed to add two more results. So it grew exponentially, but there was a threshold where you're not overwhelming the developer and you're still returning more relevant results. But finding that, and it might be different from person to person as well, <laughs> because different people want to look at different numbers of results. Right. Exactly. Well, and it's highly dependent on the program itself. Yeah, and actually what makes this problem so challenging is that the query is really one of the most important determining factors in the success of the search, even more so than like word choice in the program and the structure, because if the query is a bad query, it doesn't matter how good the search technique, <laughs> technique is, it's going to be a bad result. So it, it's a function of the query itself, the word distribution in the program, and the structure. So that's why it's so hard to make a general solution. So what's the research impact we've had so far going this work? With navigation exploration tools, they were typically manual and slow for large and scattered code. We've added automated support to leverage using natural language and program structure information, as well as location, to outperform competing state-of-the-art techniques. And in terms of search tools, they typically return irrelevant results and miss relevant ones. We've helped improve the precision by capturing the semantics of word occurrences using these phrasal concepts in SWUM as well as improving recall by combining search and exploration. But there's certainly more we could do along these lines. And so just to summarize, so the insights I've tried to share with you today 
are combining natural language and program structure, taking advantage of word location, and using word context through phrasal concepts. And so I've talked about using that to improve query formulation, software search, and program exploration. But there's tons of other software engineering applications where this could be used. I am just one woman, and I haven't had time <laughs> to try it, try it out in all these different places. So SWAM captures phrasal concepts, and our goal is that this can become an interface for software engineering tool designers and researchers to help improve linguistic analyses for software. That's our long-term goal in trying to develop this. And in future, we're hoping to really explore the other ways that text, and specifically this SWAM model, can be used for other software engineering applications to solve other software engineering problems and to study, to keep pushing this search further, study what actual developers are searching for so we can further refine and better meet developer needs. Maybe they're not all just general purpose and we need to start specializing. Okay, so that's it for me, unless you have more questions. Thank you for that. Okay, you're <laughs> I have one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought at all about how one might change languages or uh, annotations that programmers can add to improve this process? I, I'm really more interested in the language. Like, is there mm -hmm. anything we can do at the language level to make this easier and more accurate? Well, I think if the right now, I, uh, developers have tons of choice in choosing their identifiers, and I think that's great power because we can be really flexible, but at the same time it makes it really hard. There's no standard naming conventions. If in how you're calling methods and naming the methods, if it's slightly more forced in the structure of verbs and direct objects, there'd be a lot less ambiguity. If I knew like, okay, this is the action that's taking place and this is the objects it's working on, I, that would make it a lot clearer, I think, for what we're trying to do. So clarifying the noun verb. Right, the action and the, the objects. Names. Yeah, and, and really what we found in general is actions and verbs in source code are typically used very interchangeably and synonymously, and that's actually the biggest source of, okay. of okay. <laughs> issue. Um, but the nouns, they tend to be pretty consistent because they're typically objects which get one name and they're used everywhere. That's one fixed name. So it's an interesting blend of, of word choice and word restriction. It's way more restrictive than a random average natural language document because you don't get all these different forms of the words because once the identifier is fixed, everywhere else in the program has to use it that same exact way. But then the actions, those typically aren't, objects typically don't encapsulate actions, so there's a lot more word choice and variability. So anything from execute to fire to do, we have so many synonyms for that one simple concept, compute, compare. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different verbs that are used to mean the same thing. So it seems like it may not be actually changing the language, but helping them as they develop. It's like you could have an IDE mm -hmm. that either gives you like choices about the verbs you should be using at certain points, yep. or like does like the word squiggles underneath, right? Like, like yeah, like are you sure you mean this? Or yeah. yeah, like we had a method like do print, or you know, what are the semantics of of helping verbs like can fire? Like can something fire? What does that mean for what that method is doing? And there's a lot you can you can program in and learn from how it's used in a, right now. Like for example, Host et al, they did a Java programmer's phrasebook where they analyze the verbs and when is a verb used and what does that method structure typically look like when that verb is used there and so they could debug uh, poorly named methods. And so encoding that and building it into the IDE would really help us better leverage the text that's in there because it'd be more organized. The, the more ambiguity you can take away, the better the results are gonna be. Mm -hmm. Sort of in the opposite direction, though. Like, you could try to preserve that ambiguity as much as possible mm -hmm. through syntactic analysis, right? So that you don't just take, I, I mean, I don't know to what extent you do this already. Are you taking sort of a one best analysis, or do you have some packed forest representation of the natural language side? Or? Uh, we do, we try and preserve the original as much as possible. Um, I mean, of course, it, it explodes, right? Right. But, but in practice, so a lot of my work is in machine translation, right? And so when you throw syntax in, you mm -hmm. can explore all the syntactic possibilities presented by one English sentence when you're translating into Japanese. But, right. but you can explore a highly likely subset, and if you have an ambiguity-preserving representation that packs away some of the exponential combinations, we can get much better wins that way than just by looking over the one best at syntactic. Right, so right now, in, in the model I've shown you, it's 
it's just one best. It, I, I pick one way of doing it. But we had we had an undergrad that was working on using more advanced analysis and using more even more positional information, um, and she was looking at all the different possibilities and then choosing between them using accuracies, things like that. Um, and so we have pushed it. It's not quite integrated <laughs> because every time you change the parse speech tagging, you have to change the parsing rule implementation. And so we're working on making a very general way that you could read that into a file <laughs> or something to make it really easy to change. But right now our challenge is how do we design this interface in the system so that to make that really easy to change in the future. So, but definitely, and we, the more you can take it, We've, we've tried to avoid presenting multiple possibilities other than something like an equivalence, like, okay, these two things are connected, we think they're the same. We've tried to avoid giving two parses because they could have completely different semantic parses if you have two different syntactic parses. So we've tried to, uh, to, to pick one, but maybe affiliate accuracy with it. That's not implemented yet, but our goal would be with each rule is associated in accuracy for both the part of speech tagging and the semantic parsing. All right, cool. Great, thanks. <laughs>